We'll cap off this session with one that features the museum's own historians and presidential council advisory board members. This is uh, called The Legacies of the Second World War. Now, Dr. Nick Mueller will present and then lead a roundtable discussion with Dr. Will Hitchcock and Dr. Jeremy Surrey on lasting legacies and lessons of the war. Now, I, I know for this group, Dr. Mueller really needs no introduction, but you know, Nick is the, the founding president and CEO and emeritus here. With the opening of Liberation Pavilion last month, uh, you know, arguably Nick saw the culmination of, of three decades of, of toil, you know, sweat, probably some tears. <laughs> blood. <laughs> yeah, a bit of blood. <laughs> but yeah, incredible uh, inspiration and brain power has gone into that. And, and it's, it's really been an incredible driving force, not only for that, but other initiatives such as travel, conferences. Uh, he's authored two books, uh, with the third to be coming next year. Uh, but uh, without further ado, let's leave time for, for Nick and this incredible panel. Uh, Nick, over to you. All right. Thank you all. It's uh, wonderful to be with you again. And uh, I, I want to thank you all personally for your loyalty, uh, for your support for this museum uh, and all of our efforts here in the museum and our presidential counselors who are here at the dais as well as some in the audience who helped advise us and uh, contributed to the programs, the exhibits, the tours uh, that we have developed over the years. Uh, so, so thank you for that. This is your museum. How many people here have been to a conference before? Just raise your hands. Look at that. And how many people is the first time? All right. Okay, so now you're gonna join next year. You're gonna be part of the continuing uh, a group of people who continue to come. So uh, to introduce our, our panel, just very briefly, you have the bios in your brochure, so there's no need to, to spend a, a great deal of time uh, mentioning, but I do need to say that, uh, Cover that, that, that they are yeah. among the most distinguished uh, uh, historians in America on the subject we're about to talk about. Uh, Will Hitchcock is uh, William C. Corcoran Professor of History at the University of Virginia, and he's published four books uh, on the subject of liberation and post-war diplomacy. Uh, the one that you see on the screen, The Bitter Road to Freedom, will give you an idea of one of those books, and of course, uh, the magnificent uh, volume, uh, The Age of Eisenhower, a New York Times uh, bestseller. Uh, and uh, one reviewer remarked that this book, more than any other, will shape how the future remembers the Eisenhower era. He's a John Lewis Gaddis, a Yale professor, Pulitzer Prize-winning author as well. So, Jeremy Surrey, a Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at UT Austin. Uh, he's author of 11 books, and his focus is on foreign policy, and uh, his book uh, here, Liberty's uh, Surest Guardian, uh, that you uh, are, are looking at as an ex exceptional uh, book, uh, talking about uh, uh, America's nation building from the founders to Obama, power and protest, and uh, also covers the detente and Henry Kissinger and the American century. And so is in much demand these days to talk about Henry Kissinger. And this book is regarded in, in one review as, as a, an electrify, having an electrifying effect uh, on scholarship and on, on hopes of political leaders everywhere who seem to be grappling with the questions of sailmate, both domestically and externally. And that's uh, uh, just a couple of the blurbs that I think are important for you all to know. So this is our theme, uh, and I, in the center, I should say, the, uh, the Four Freedoms book, uh, Will has a, the last chapter uh, in that book on, uh, specifically on, on the Four Freedoms. Now, to frame this a little bit around the museum's uh, last uh, capstone pavilion, the Liberation Pavilion, uh, which uh, really was conceived some 20 years ago, but uh, went through a major revision about eight or 10 years after uh, we opened, and it forms the context, I think, uh, because of the theme that we're discussing, our point of view here at the museum, 
It forms a framework for this uh, uh, panel uh, today and, and, and remarks. Uh, it, it initially, when we did the master plan in 2002, it was a very American-centric, looking at the legacies and the benefits of the GI Bill. We did talk about the Marshall Plan and imagine that, and uh, civil rights and women's rights and those things. But what began to become more important as we thought about it, and we're getting the other buildings underway, is that this was a global war with global consequences, and America which uh, was an isolationist power, didn't want to be in the war uh, with extremism um, uh, in the midst of the Great Depression. Uh, that we, had, we emerged now as, as a world leader. And what were we leading? What was uh, our policies at home and abroad that were, were different? Uh, and so we uh, began to shift to a more global orientation, as you will see if you have not yet been uh, to the Liberation Pavilion, and I hope you get to do that this afternoon after this, after this session. But basically, we came down on, on, on uh, the, the theme that uh, the wartime and post-war legacy of, this, uh, of, of World War II was about the defense of democracy, defense of freedom, and the human rights against authoritarian regimes first of all in World War II, and then later in the rest of the century from communism, the Cold War. And, and the board approved this change of emphasis. And if we look at this, uh, our mission here, uh, about the way the war, why the war was fought, how it was won, and what it means today. And that is why this is bolded here, because that's the third leg of the museum mission. And so in struggling and designing this uh, pavilion, we had to understand what the meaning was. And I can assure you, our presidential counselors uh, spent two or three years uh, struggling with it. If you ever try to get historians to agree on something, it's a miracle. Uh, but uh, uh, I got pretty beat up in the process. But, uh, but finally, uh, that we achieved a consensus among our staff, our presidential counselors. Uh, Stephen Watson, Mike Bell, and uh, Rob Satino, and all of us uh, coming down uh, on this theme. Uh, <clears throat> so the question our exhibit designers asked us, though, when we were designing the World War II Museum uh, in 2002, how do you answer the question of, so what? <laughs> so what difference did World War II make to our country, to the world? And we weren't ready for that question because we thought we were just designing a museum just to talk about the origins of the war and the war itself. Uh, and that raised a whole lot of questions that continued on for the next uh, 10 or 15 years. And they said, how are people going to look at your exhibits 100 years from now, 50 years from now? How do you answer that question? What was the meaning of it after all? Why did we fight? Was it just Pearl Harbor? Why did we insist on unconditional surrender? Well, it was it a fight to the finish for us? Fight to the finish for civilization as we knew it. Was it a good war? It was a good versus evil? It was democracy versus fascism? Was it a war of ideas? What in the hell does it mean? And that's what this, now this is the hardest pavilion we have ever designed, because you can tease out the complexities of those, of those questions. So that's our answer to the big question of the significance of the war after 1945. Now, of course, it depends on what nation you're in. Uh, you will have a different perspective on the meaning of, of the war, whether you're vanquished, a victim, or a, a victor or you're a bystander or a perpetrator, all those change your perspectives of that meaning for you and for your country. So freedom and democracy is this museum's answer to why we fought. And we found the evidence in policies and decisions uh, and actions and pronouncements of our presidents 
And, but you don't have to just look at the war. We've found those ideals and those values going all the way back to our, the founding of our country with the Declaration of Independence. But in the 20th century, these values really began to emerge in the struggles for democracy in the heights of the Great Depression, and we had extremists too. Uh, and America and democracy was under attack even though we were an isolationist power. Uh, we didn't want any part of the war in Europe or Asia. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, we had extremists in our own country uh, amidst this uh, tremendous uh, depression. Now remember, in 2000, I mean in 1917, our president, Woodrow Wilson, said he was going to make the world safe for democracy. Well, he failed at that, and we almost failed at that as well. And I know our panelists are going to talk about that a little bit, but we failed. I mean, the, the, the Great Depression, when uh, economically we failed, uh, politically uh, we had these extremist attacks from left and right. D diplomatically, we were isolated. Uh, militarily, we were unprepared uh, when uh, we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Uh, no allies, isolationists, weak, and that's what Hirohito, Tojo, and Hitler all thought, that the democracies were passive, weak, ineffective. The forces for the future were either communism or fascism, and this was the rise of the fascist powers. Now, going to 30,000 feet altitude and looking at this struggle between democracies and authoritarian solutions to how you organize society, you have to go back only to the American Revolution a couple centuries ago or the French Revolution, which d dissolved into a reign of terror and followed by Napoleon. So these elemental forces of democracy and freedom trying to free themselves and save their nations and their countries uh, go back a couple hundred years. So they're going to go on at least another 50 years, 100 years, but freedom is always under pressure. So our touchstone, though, for this uh, 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 presentation begins with uh, FDR on January 6, uh, 1940, 11 months before Pearl Harbor, when he made his address to the nation in the State of the Union, enunciating uh, four freedoms. Now, this was not a call to action. This wasn't anything like his uh, Day of Infamy speech that came after Pearl Harbor. He was laying the foundation for what Americans value, what we might fight for, and the values of speech and religion, freedom from fear, freedom from want. And he said, and I know Will will talk about this, everywhere in the world. So all of a sudden, this is a global aspiration. It's, this is what we believe. But if all the world were like this, now you might say that's very idealistic. And it was aspirational. Indeed, it was. But it's a very expansive vision of peace that required, perhaps, drove the idea for unconditional surrender of these totalitarian regimes that we were, we were fighting. So we settled on that as our theme for the Liberation Pavilion as driver of our domestic and foreign policies uh, since uh, World War II. And there has been no war, war world war, yet. Uh, we didn't do so well only 20 years between World War I and World War II. But the globalization of these values was adhered to and accepted by all of our presidents who were World War II veterans all the way up until Bush 41 at least and beyond, but who knows where the future will go. But we're looking to the past. It's up to you all to, take, uh, to agree or disagree and look to the future. But now I'm just going to do real quick wrap up with a, a couple of ways to set the stage and how we set the stage in some of our exhibits in, in the Liberation Pavilion. Uh, and uh, I guess I got to point this here. Yes. So this is how you enter the Liberation Pavilion uh, with uh, dog tags representing some 16 million who served our country during that time. 
417,000 who perished. So the emphasis here is on the sacrifice of the country. And then we go into the cost of victory, and we, we look at that, both in terms of the data of the 65 million who, are, who died, civilians representing two-thirds. It was the most destructive war in human history. It's hard to know that that was a good war, uh, or that any war is good for that matter. But we felt like there was a moral tone to America's journey through this war, and that FDR and our founding fathers, in a way, had set that tone in terms of the values of what America uh, believes. And that the outcome was far better than the alternative. So there's a redemptive tone to the theme that we, we discuss, but it was also an ex existential war. It was a war that required everything we have had to defeat the combined powers of the Axis forces in the most violent, violent war in human history. And we utterly destroyed our fascist enemies, despite the fact that we were ranked 17th in the world in terms of our defenses at the outset. In any event, uh, if we move forward, we, um, I keep forgetting this, we do a flashback to Anne Frank, because the, the overall theme for the whole floor is finding hope in a world destroyed. And here's a story that everyone knows, who found hope despite her uh, isolation and fear for her life in the annex. Uh, and then we have the voices of those who were liberated the moment the GIs opened the camps and thus gave them life and freedom again. And then we move to the second floor, and we, we look at the Nuremberg trials and new crimes against humanity, not in Nuremberg only, but in Japan, in the SCAP trials. And so we keep moving forward in 1948, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the same stream that flowed from the four freedoms from President Roosevelt, now deceased. Great Responsibilities Theater will talk about America's res global responsibilities that we assumed uh, after 45. Uh, and t as already mentioned in the previous session, social change, the advances and the struggles and the protests that came about through uh, the, the fighting for the right to fight of the African Americans was really about, uh, well, I fought for my country. I need those, need more advances in my own rights too. And women advanced coming out of the factories and, and uh, many staying in the factories. Uh, the GI Bill, which lifted the country's higher education uh, system. The rocketry that put a man on the moon. So there are a lot of positive things uh, as well as tension and protest that, uh, that are part of this. And on the third floor, the Freedom Theater, uh, which is the capstone experience of the Liberation Pavilion, where the torch is passed to you and to our visitors to see how you will protect and defend freedom in the future. This doesn't mean that this is settled, it's settled history in terms of our ability to document uh, the, the trajectory of of freedom and democracy and what we said we'd stand for. Now, the cynics would say these, uh, these are very idealistic uh, goals that FDR had. But here we are today. Do we still believe those things? Do those values, do those ideals resonate with any of us? That's a question that everybody gets to answer. Uh, the memory wars about the meaning of World War II are still going on. We held a conference on this during COVID. Some 15,000 people tuned in to hear people from different countries, historians, museum leaders, talking about how their different countries viewed the war. And we end it with uh, uh, our own <coughs> view back to FDR 
in January of 1940. There is a, a, a comp an organization called the Freedom House that tracks freedom, the countries that are more free and less free and not free all around the world. This map is from 1972. It changes quite a lot uh, just this past year. So there have been great advances in, in, in nations that are now free and, uh, and moving toward democracy. But according to their annual Wall Street Journal uh, publication, uh, freedom and democracy have declined in the last uh, 10 years, uh, 12 years, since about 2008. In any event, uh, every serviceman, all 16 million, received this victory medal at the completion of their service. On the back of it, you can see, are the four freedoms. So uh, that's a good point to move on right now and stop, and, and let's get the panel engaged. And, uh, and uh, with the questions and with that frame of reference, I'm going to just pose a few questions, and then we'll get to the audience. Uh, but uh, looking back and what we've just uh, talked about, uh, Maybe both of you, but maybe start with Will. Uh, was World War II a war of ideas at its core, or was it about America's self-interest? Maybe that's a place to start. Yeah, that's, a, that's an easy one. Whew. I thought this was going to be just a casual conversation, but um, <laughs> it is. That's a, big, that's a big topic and a great question. Let me just start by saying I saw the Liberation Pavilion today for the first time, and it's magnificent, and I hope all of you um, will get over there. I'm sure that that's uh, on your agenda. Um, I, I, the, the Second World War was most certainly a war of ideas, though um, what's interesting and what's different about it, the First World War, which Woodrow Wilson also framed as a war of ideas, was that it was also a war of American interests. Um, but I think Roosevelt was better than Woodrow Wilson in many ways at um, making the argument, making the intellectual argument for what Americans were really going to do in the Second World War, why, they, why he felt they had to fight it. Now, the freedom from want and freedom from fear and want and freedom of speech and religion um, is, a, is just a gloss, a summary, a very, the, the most essential part of the four freedom speech. But to, to answer this question of it, it was World War II a war of ideas, I just want to point out that Roosevelt had been developing the, I, the argument that lies behind the four freedoms for a long time. And I think it's crucial we understand that he, you know, when we see him in 1940 and 41, we're, we're catching him after two terms plus of governing in the greatest crisis that America had at that time ever faced, Ar arguably. I mean, the Civil War, um, of course, uh, uh, an existential crisis as well, but, this, but a, an, an enormous crisis for Americans facing in the Depression. And he felt that it had, by 1940, Franklin Roosevelt felt that for all of the difficulties the country still faced, democracy had been vindicated as a form of government. Democracy had been vindicated. Democracy had triumphed over the Great Depression. Now, there was still a long way to go. There was still uh, unemployment. There was still uh, difficulties of all kinds. But he felt the country had proven that democracy could be resilient in the face of a global crisis. Why does that matter? Because all of the fascist powers and the imperialist powers claimed that democracy could not meet the demands of the modern world. Democracy was weak, just as Nick said, out of date. And so he came into, so when, by 1940, he starts to make an argument that exactly this, we have passed through eight years of a terrible crisis. And in 1940, he then says, we now face an even greater crisis. This is before America is in the war. He is identifying the threat of fascism and of Nazism and of Japanese imperialism and of domination and oppression and tyranny as an existential crisis to American democracy. It's so important to grasp the centrality of democracy to Roosevelt's framing of the whole war. Because while we use the word freedom and democracy interchangeably, he didn't. What he meant by democracy was a form of self-government. Mm -hmm. And government was what he stressed. That government could fulfill the needs, meet the needs of people in, 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 a, in a common enterprise of self-government. And so he begins to make the argument in 1940 that democracy has this responsibility um, not just to protect itself at home, 
but to meet the challenge of fascism in the world because there is no way for these two systems of government to coexist. That is a radical and very, um, uh, quite an extraordinary argument that he begins making in 1940. And he says the Axis powers are telling us they're coming for us. They're coming for your democracy. So he says, some people say you can live on this lone island and, and forget about the rest of the world. America's going to be fine on our lone island. He comes to Charlottesville in June 1940 and he says, that to me is a nightmare. And it's a nightmare, as he says, of a people lodged in prison, handcuffed, hungry, and fed through the bars from day to day by the contemptuous, unpitying masters of other continents. America on, a, on an island is America imprisoned by the fascists. This is, a night, this is June 1940. We're still 18 months away from Pearl Harbor. He's developing the case. So what my, my point is that he's doing this throughout the year of 1940, to, and in the beginning of 1941, he gets the Four Freedom Speech. So he's riding a crest. He's riding an intellectual argument. He's persuading the country to see the cause that looms ahead as one about saving democracy at home but recognizing that democracy in America cannot survive if it is surrounded by um, tyrants and aggressive imperialists and fascists in the rest of the world. We might disagree with that argument, and you're free to disagree with that argument, but that's what Roosevelt was arguing for. So this is why I do think the Second World War was a war of ideas. Once the war began, of course, he didn't have the luxury of kicking back and saying, hey, let's talk about democracy and freedom in an intellectual sense. But he. he he was preparing the country to frame this, the coming sacrifice around the idea that our, our form of government was at risk. And that's what I think that Liberation Pavilion successfully asks viewers. Um, what are the risks to democracy today? And the point is not that, that there, there, are new, there are new threats today. The point is that there have always been threats to democracy. Democracy is a provocative form of government. It allows people to speak their mind. It allows people to have uh, freedom of speech and religion. It allows them f the, the prospect of freedom from fear and want. These are ideas that are really quite radical. They're connected to Roosevelt's experience in the New Deal. And he is, he is setting up the country for this really major effort to project the American experience into the world. We could argue whether that's the way we should run or use our power now, but that certainly was how he thought of it in 1940 and 41. Well, Jeremy, uh, why don't you weigh in uh, on, on that same question, war of ideas, or is it uh, self-interest? Uh, I didn't know if Will was going to leave me anything left to say. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here with uh, two good friends and colleagues and scholars who I uh, respect so much. Um, of course, the war is about democracy for Roosevelt, and my favorite Roosevelt speech uh, is actually a speech he gives a few years earlier than uh, the war in Cleveland, where he talks about how, quote, every generation writes a new chapter in the book of democracy. That's actually the inspiration for the weekly podcast I do called This Is Democracy. Wasn't that cool how I got the advertisement <laughs> for the podcast in there? Um, I, I think it's dangerous to call it a war of ideas, although I agree with everything Will said. I mean, ideas are central, and the idea of democracy, the importance of democracy. And of course, democracy is in many ways at the core of American self-interest. What else could Americans be for but for democracy? Uh, but it's very dangerous uh, to call this a war of ideas, because then it justifies uh, so many other adventures in fighting for ideas that we believe self-righteously to be worth fighting for in cases where we're not prepared, nor should we be fighting. And I think the misunderstanding of what we mean by a war of ideas is really important to interrogate quite a little. So uh, I'm, I'm a, a scholar of uh, Karl von Clausewitz, among other uh, writers. And uh, many of you are familiar with Clausewitz's classic on war. And his uh, key point there is that war is politics by other means. And I think if we take Roosevelt seriously, as my colleagues do, uh, his true strength is as a political master. He was fighting a war of ideas. He was fighting a war for American self-interest. But he was willing to dive deeply into the contradictions and the limitations that came with that. It was not just a war of ideas for him. It was not just a war of self-interest. 
Um, and I think we can see this in many, many ways. He was willing to compromise. He was willing to, as Clausewitz would say, deal with the frictions and fog of conflict, as most other leaders aren't. He had a sense of what America was fighting for, for freedoms, but he had a sense that in fighting for those four freedoms, you often had to do things that ran against those four freedoms. The bombing of civilians, in Dresden and elsewhere. The use of, or the preparation of atomic bombs to be used in war. The internment of Japanese Americans, or Americans of Japanese descent, we should say more accurately. Uh, most of these are things that have come under spotlight and often criticized by historians like myself, and they should be criticized. Uh, but they're also part of what war entails. They're part of what war entails. This was not, for Roosevelt, a war that was going to be a war for democracy that would be without costs and sacrifices, without costs and sacrifices to the very values that were the reasons we were in the war itself. And so I think it's important not to call it either a war of ideas or a war of self-interest. I think it's important to call it actually a war with a particular mission at a particular moment. And it's not necessarily a model for other wars. It's a war that in its time reflected the politics of the moment, the politics of the United States, the politics of fascism, the politics of communism. And Roosevelt invented a new politics in the war. And this connects to our discussion of liberation. He invented a new way of America's managing other countries overseas and working with them. The Grand Alliance as a very difficult enterprise. You know in the photos, the great photos from the various war conferences, Roosevelt is always seated in the middle, right? Churchill looks like he's on one side, he's already had at least a quart of scotch. <laughs> Stalin's on the other, Rimrod straight, and uh, as I think one journalist write, writes, uh, Roosevelt's always seated in the center like an insurance salesman. He's managing the politics of this alliance. He manages the politics at home. Will has already referred to that. Uh, at times, even running afoul of the constitutional limitations on his presidency. And I think Roosevelt had a vision of managing the complex politics after the war that we often lose sight of. He wasn't seeking after the war for the United States to be in control of the world. I think he would have been very uncomfortable with many of the elements of American policy after World War II. But he also recognized the United States couldn't go back home. Nick already referred to this after the war in the way we did uh, after World War I. He was, as I think Robert Dalek wrote years ago, a halfway Wilsonian. You know, Roosevelt was a halfway everything. <laughs> and maybe that's the genius of his politics. Uh, I just want to close with this point. I mean, I, I really think that when we try to come up with these simple labels for such, something so complex as war, good war, bad war, war of politics, war of self-interest, we actually set ourselves up to have misunderstandings of what war really is. And again, this is where I come back to Clausewitz. War is complexity, war is uncertainty, and war should rarely be fought. And when fought, it should be fought with open eyes, recognizing the complexity of the politics that one enters into. I don't think we've had a president who understood that as well as Roosevelt since Roosevelt's time. Well, you can see how difficult it was to get unanimity about uh, the freedom as a, as a, a legacy of, of World War II. But uh, even uh, critics of, of, of that position, uh, like John Bodnar, uh, about the good war and, and freedom and so forth, would, uh, would still say that freedom did become a, a central political vision of post-war history. Would you? all agree with that, uh, or uh, how, how imperfectly uh, it was applied in every case. I mean, I would make the argument that, uh, and you, we always have a, a, an opportunity to choose uh, whether we are going to be cynics about, uh, about our, our country's values and motives uh, uh, or not. Uh, we can emphasize the mistakes and the darker sides, uh, but if that paralyzes, us from uh, finding uh, what value uh, was reflected mm -hmm. in Roosevelt and, and Eleanor's uh, and then and the building of alliances and globalizing 
his ideas. And maybe we should talk about it in the context of the global impact, because after sure. all, we're taking a position that this legacy of World War II that we are, have identified uh, is, is one that Roosevelt universalized. I yeah, mean, I uh, mean, we're, we're, in, we're intelligent human beings and we can hold, some you know, of us are. <laughs> we can hold two, two ideas that uh, don't necessarily seem at first to match, but actually are complementary. And, and in this case, Nick, you hit just the right note, which is we must be, I think can be, and, and always will be immensely proud of the achievements of the World War II generation, full stop. I mean, this is an extraordinary period of American and, and world history. Um, and just, you don't have to take my word for it, go across the street and look at the testimonies of the men who were um, uh, freed from the camps in the spring of 1945 that are on video in the Liberation Pavilion. And, and you know, it's, a, it's the thing you will remember most, uh, I think, uh, of, of the entire Liberation Pavilion experience, certainly the thing I'll remember. Um, it's extraordinarily moving, it's personal, it's human, it's authentic, and the United States is right at the center of those testimonies those American boys who came and opened the gates. That's what that story is about. And you won't forget it when you hear it from the lips of those who experienced that moment. It's extremely, um, it's a difficult moment, but it's a very, it's a moment to be proud of. You know, that said, we often ask, um, so, you know, liberation for whom? Um, and of course, it was an unfinished liberation, especially, especially when you see it in a global context. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, it, you know, of course it was an unfinished liberation. It was beyond any nation's capacity to transform the world in the way that Roosevelt had aspired to. But he did set a, a vision. Um, of course, Nazism was, was vanquished, um, and, and, uh, and thank God. Communism wasn't, so the liberation for Eastern Europe had to be postponed by a, a generation or more. Um, of course, Jewish persecution didn't end either. Uh, there were still uh, displaced persons camps filled with uh, Jews who were homeless now. They could neither go back to the communist-dominated Eastern Europe, uh, their homes had been, where their homes had been destroyed, yet they still couldn't emigrate to Palestine slash Israel because the British was, were keeping out people from there. They couldn't come to the United States because we still had quite a strict uh, immigration barriers. So the, 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 many, the very small surviving Jewish um, a community in, uh, in Europe that found itself in, in uh, DP camps were not quite liberated. Uh, liberation, but not, not at home yet. So their, their diaspora continued. Um, you know, was Germany liberated? Uh, that's an interesting debate. Uh, what about France? France, what, what, uh, the, the end of the war brought a liberation of sorts, but it also allowed them to sweep under the rug what had happened in France during World War II. And then if you shift your, your gaze to Asia, why well, you have um, no, nothing like a liberation. You, you have uh, the shift from one kind of war, the Second World War, into a new period of conflict, civil war in China the reoccupation of imperial outposts by the British and the French, so another generation of colonial war yet to come. It was not, that in, in no way tarnishes or limits or is the American achievements of World War II. But it just reminds us that the, the Second World War is a piece, it's maybe the flywheel of a larger global story that, ha, that begins before World War II and ends much, much later than 1945. Yeah. Well, and Henry Kissinger was, was no uh, a fan of, uh, of uh, President Roosevelt, so you're the, you're the, <laughs> well, you're the Kissinger well, guy. That's so, uh, actually. Well, well, he, I mean, he, yeah. he, he actually had respect for Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he got his first job through Roosevelt, <laughs> yeah, in a sense. Right. Um, you know, I think this is one area where when we talk about freedom in World War II, and I think we have to talk about freedom in World War II, I think that's the strength of the Liberation uh, Pavilion, and I think it's, it's, it's necessary. Um, that's where there actually is some continuity, mm -hmm. I think, to World War I. I think uh, World Wars I and II together uh, make freedom, the questions of freedom, central to an international discourse, an international discussion. Legitimacy for any regime <coughs> after World War I and certainly after World War II comes from claiming that it's making its people freer. Very few regimes will claim otherwise after World War II. Most regimes will make different legitimacy claims before the late 19th century. So there's a fundamental structure in the expectation of what governments are supposed to do. That doesn't mean they always fulfill those goals. But I think one of the shifts that occurs in the 20th century is a shift toward not just the sovereignty of states, that's an 18th, 19th century story, but now the emphasis upon states making claims that their people will be freer. 
and there are debates about what kind of freedom. Socialist and communist regimes define freedom in one particular way. What becomes social democratic regimes in Europe define freedom in a particular way. The United States defines freedom in its own way. And scholars, of course, have written wonderful books on, on precisely this. But it's that debate that I think World War II contributes to. I think one of the real achievements of World War II is for the United States to put itself behind the argument, as it didn't fully after World War I, that all states should be able to choose and all people should be able to choose their own governments. Now, we do not always follow through on that. And as Will said so well, if you take a broader global view, there's a very different experience in the Philippines, for example, where MacArthur returns after ignominiously being defeated. Um, there's a different experience in the Philippines than there is, for example, uh, in France or Italy, or than there is in a, a place like uh, Finland, which is not really liberated by the United States, but certainly helped, and certainly not liberated by the Soviet Union, but helped by the course of the war. So there are many different ways in which uh, the United States is able to try to, or somewhat successfully, or not successfully follow through. But I do think what is significant, and I'm glad the United Nations is a big part of this, is that the United Nations then creates a forum which, within which the presumption is that states will govern on behalf of the freedom of their people. And that becomes the extended debate after the war. I think the United States as an entity is not fully prepared after World War II to understand the implications of that. We struggle with that. Uh, for my mind, I would love to see more in the Liberation Pavilion. I'd love to have, it ha have a fourth floor where we <laughs> talked about places like Vietnam, where the United States uh, is early on dead set against French colonialism. If there's one colonial empire Roosevelt hated, it was France. Uh, but then the United States... Well, he didn't like the British Empire very much either. Well, fair <laughs> but, but you'd agree that the oh, French... Oh, yeah, no, he really irked him. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's, I know many have written on this, right? Uh, Roosevelt, I think, did not have a vision of the French regaining their empire in a place like Indochina. But then the United States, for reasons largely related to anti-communist containment, reestablishing French power in Europe, finds itself actually supporting empire by the mid to late 1940s in Vietnam. And we all in this room know where that story goes. That, that's part of this debate about freedom and the appropriate role for American power in the pursuit of freedom and the appropriate role of the United States in defining what it sees as the acceptable guidelines uh, for freedom after uh, the war. And, and I just want to close to this answer by, by making a point that you know, the freedom from want and freedom from fear remain hotly debated within the United States and outside the United States after the war. That's a good thing, but it also shows the complications for the United States uh, after World War II. Does freedom from want mean that the United States has an obligation uh, to perhaps uh, limit its market interests in certain areas or not? Does it mean the United States should support anti-colonialism? In some cases, yes. In some cases, the United States doesn't do that. Uh, so this, th that debate coming out of the war, I think, highlights your point, Nick, why freedom is so important. But it's contested. It's not, it's not stamped with one definition at the end of the war. That's correct. And, you know, uh, Nick, if I could just add, I think yeah. Jeremy's on to an important point, which is it's, 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 it's tricky to, glo to, to draw too large a conclusion from the Second World War experience and then apply it everywhere else, as if it's a, it's a, it's a roadmap right. to deal with other crises. Yet it, it, it raises American expectations, yes. you know, and it keeps reminding us of, of, of the, the, the pro, you know, the, in a sense, the, the idealism and the prospects of uh, American leadership in the world. But it's also, it, it's, it is a little risky to keep pulling on the Second World War as, the, as, as, as if we want to, exp, you know, apply that method elsewhere. But I, I, so, so it's, it's limited in time and place. That's absolutely right. Um, and I just want to say that Roosevelt had in mind that his principal purpose was to was to defeat fascism. So he didn't, ha you know, his principal purpose was not to destroy empires or to transform the world. He really had as go his goal the victory over Nazism and fascism, and I think that's important because he was making the case that democracy is a, is the actual answer to the future and fascism isn't. But fascism was the modern ideology. Fascism was the futuristic ideology. Mm -hmm. It offered a new form of government, a new, a new way of, of solving the crises of, of modernity. Roosevelt rejected that. He said, those who seek 
to establish systems of government based on regimentation of all human beings by a handful of individual rulers, call it a new order? It is not new, and it is not order. <laughs> what he was saying is fascism is just tyranny that, it, that humankind has known from the beginning of time. What's new is democracy that, pers that pursues social uh, justice. That's new. So this is, at the end of the day, what makes us come back to these words. That's what gives them the resonance that they still have. Of course, it's not a geopolitical map to solve the problems of today, but it is an intellectual set of aspirations that he laid out that I think still inspires us. Well, just one question before we open it up to the audience here, though. I mean, to, to, it was a, a, a point of its time and place, as you, as you said. But if you look at the three uh, hotspots around the world right now, uh, here looking at uh, Israel, uh, you're looking at Ukraine, you're looking at uh, Taiwan, all uh, legacies of World War II. You're looking at the authoritarian theocracy of Iran, uh, Russia, and China. Um, and the same issues are being uh, discussed about uh, uh, domestically and internationally about uh, the strength of democracies to, to respond and to find ways uh, through this. Uh, do you find any, any uh, I mean, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, as they say. <laughs> Mark Wade, yes. Uh, and uh, freedom is always under pressure. Uh, democracy is, too. And as you read every day in the newspapers and new books are coming out all the time about the fact that uh, democracy may be failing. Uh, and, and so people need to uh, make decisions about, uh, about policies, and our government does, too, uh, in, in this context. What say you? Well, I, I think it's one of the reasons we study history, right? Not because the past is any kind of recipe for the right. present, but because the past has a long tail. The past stays with us. I always remind my students that you should think of history as archaeology. There are layers of other periods still there. We might not see them, but they're still there, and they influence what comes out of the ground. Um, it's sort of like family history, too, right? Uh, grandpa's still with us, even though Grandpa's not with us. Uh, the memories, the yeah. stories. Um, and, and each of the conflicts you mentioned, I think, is in some ways the unfinished business of World War II. Now, you could say in many cases it's the unfinished business of a conflict before that. Wars are easier to start than they are to end. Mm -hmm. They don't end just because uh, everyone says the war is over, just because we say, okay, that chapter in the textbook is done and we move on to the next unit. Uh, I, I just wrote a book on the, how the Civil War still matters in the United States. And I live in Texas, and it definitely matters, um, <laughs> as it does here, too, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's uh, absolutely true. There are people in the audience who I'm sure are more experts on Ukraine. Alex Ritchie, who's out there, certainly knows more about this than I do. But uh, the conflict in Ukraine is, is eerily in the same places, with many of the same dynamics that one had uh, in the early 1940s. I'm, I'm reminded of Alex Dolan's old, old book where he made the point that the biggest mistake the Nazis made when they went into Ukraine and elsewhere was actually by not turning the Ukrainians to their side. They, they, were, they were so anti-Ukrainian that the Ukrainians that were already anti-Russian <laughs> became anti-German as well. Um, and and this, is a, this is a legacy of that that we're seeing there. Israel, of course, the creation of the state of Israel, which is a complex story, and of course goes back to the 19th century and Theodore Herzl and others. Um, it, we all, I think, would agree there's no Israel without World War II. It wouldn't be there. And so these are, this is the unfinished business. What does history offer us? I don't think in any of these conflicts, Nick, it offers us some kind of silver bullet. I think it offers us three things. This is what I spent a lot of time working with students on. One. A reason to be humble. We're not going to solve any of these. But humble humility also means we can't stay out either. There's a role for the United States. We have to debate what that role is. But this silly debate we have over whether we should go in and fix it ourselves or not be involved seems uh, totally ahistorical. Right? So humility would tell us there's a complex politics to this. Second uh, lesson, I think, that comes from all of this is that uh, any kind of advancement, any kind of progress, is going to require negotiation and compromise. It's another reason I'm uncomfortable with the idea of a war of ideas, that we're going to go and fight a war, and our idea is going to win, and the other idea is going to lose. That maybe came close to happening in World War II, but didn't even happen then, right? Um, we're not going to fix things by force. Force is necessary as part of a 
array of factors you use in negotiation, but negotiation and compromise is going to be necessary. That doesn't mean we give in to Vladimir Putin. That doesn't mean we give in to Hamas. But it does mean that you can't pretend they're not going to exist. You never really eliminate your enemy. You never really eliminate your enemy. And if you think I'm wrong on that, go visit Germany as I did this summer and listen to the AF Day speak. And you will be uncertain whether we eliminated our enemy even in Germany after World War II, right? You have to negotiate. You have to compromise. That's, again, what Clausewitz is writing about. And then the third lesson, and maybe the most important one uh, for, for Americans, any commitment we undertake is going to be a much longer lasting commitment than we think. And we need to be prepared for that. We need to be prepared for longer commitments. What I respect most about the World War II generation, I'm not sure they were the greatest generation, but what I respect most is their depth and long-term commitment to the cause that they were fighting for. Mm -hmm. That was a generation that did not believe in quick victories. They did not believe in getting things done on a timetable that was politically useful necessarily at home. They fought this war for many years. They sacrificed in so many ways. And then, ladies and gentlemen, they came home and they paid the highest personal income tax rate in the history of the United States. And many of us have written about this. Uh, Americans never liked taxes, but there was no revolt against that in the late 40s, early 50s. I'm not ar arguing for taxes, by the way. <laughs> but I'm arguing for long-term commitment to what you believe in, not the belief that you can get things done fast and get out. All right, Will, final word? No. Just, uh, just to say that Eisenhower in 1954, I think it was, said, uh, as president, he said, uh, you know, there was always a little rumbling about the high taxes in the 50s, because they were very high. And he said, every good American is proud to pay his taxes. And that's why, you know, he was drummed out of the Republican Party. He was disowned by the Republican Party. <laughs> but, that is, but that is the voice of the, of the World War II generation, which yes. is sacrifice comes, democracy and freedom are hard and difficult to defend, and we have to pay taxes in order to enjoy them. It seemed an obvious statement, but it's become embattled. So uh, that's a legacy, too. You know, let's re reflect on what, it, what we have to pay in order to, to benefit and, and prosper in this uh, democratic world or democratic country. Okay, Jeremy. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Mueller, Jeremy Surrey, and Will Hitchcock. <laughs> uh, questions, please raise your hand, and Connie and I will get to you. We'll start in, to your left in the very back, gentlemen, with Connie. Thank you. Uh, great uh, panel. Uh, what argument would you make to challenge a growing number of young Americans who don't see World War II as a fight for the four freedoms, but rather a war to protect de facto corporate interests or um, empire building, um, uh, in particular in the Philippines? Um, that's it. Can you go first? While you're thinking, I'd just say I'd be happy if we can get some uh, young people to know when World War II happened. <laughs> 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 Much less uh, understand the four freedoms, but we'll uh, teach I them mean, that too. I, I, think, I think that's the, that's the right answer. <laughs> I, I, but but it's, a, it's, a, it's a provocative and, and thoughtful uh, and difficult question, you know, because it, 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 it actually asks you, how, how do we talk to young people about the world, Second World War? And I mean, I teach a big survey on World War II. I felt it was so big, in fact, I couldn't, I wasn't doing justice to it, and I, and I have tended to focus now on just the European theater because it's something I know better, and I think it, I, can, I can use different kinds of teaching materials. But, um, you know, what if it's possible that, again, contradictory ideas sometimes actually serve to illuminate uh, things? It, well, what if, it, what if it's a little bit of both? Um, do we have to have a, a Second World War narrative that is entirely flawless and entirely about, uh, about uh, ideals? Um, or, uh, but, or, or on the other hand, do we have to have a World War II narrative that basically is about lining the pockets of corporate interests? You know what? Corporations did really, really well out of the Second World War. Yes. Um, but at the same time, that's not why we fought the Second World War. So, you know, there, there's, um, I, I think it requires us to, to, to engage this is a broader point about 
how to engage you know, our students in thinking through a set of problems when there's not an obvious choice between a good answer and a bad answer. The reality of governance, of leadership, I think, is safe to say, Jeremy is a real student of leadership, is that you usually don't have the luxury of choosing between an easy and a hard choice. You've just got nothing but bad choices. They're all, they all come with costs. They all come with difficulties. There's all going to be partial failures. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Jeremy pointed to this, of the immense costs of, the, of winning the Second World War, the human cost inflicted by the United States in winning the Second World War is, un, is extraordinary. Would we therefore not have fought? Is that the solution? This is, a, this is something that I've heard amongst young people and also among a younger generation of scholars who are arguing nowadays um, that essentially the Second World War's legacy is the forever war, that America has become, <laughs> we're just gonna mess with the lights, that's gonna be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do whatever you have to do. But so that, uh, that, we, we, that we, can never we, we can never return to any kind of equilibrium. That's another argument was one here. So I think arguing about these things is tough, but it's what we do. It's, what, yeah. it's, it's the way to reason through the, the, yeah. the, the, the present moment. I think that's such a good answer, Will. I, I agree. I mean, I, and I thank you for your question. It's a great, great question. Uh, I also teach this to the 300 undergraduates every semester, and I love teaching undergraduates. By the way, they are terrific in general. They are better than their parents. Uh, they really are, and I'll tell you why if you want to know why. Uh, I actually I often tell my wife, my wife and I were undergrads at Stanford together, and I often tell my wife, wow, I mean, these kids are better than, than we were. And she says to me, no, no, they're better than you were. <laughs> Fair. Uh, but the, the truth is, I love when I get questions like that because it offers us a chance to actually do what historians do in the best sense, <coughs> which is to get us not just to recognize, as Will said so well, the balance between things, but how deceptive labels can be. So of course, of course the United States is fighting to get back to the Philippines. Of course there are business interests in the United States that as always will find a way to profit, especially from government spending. But I always point out to students, so many of the experimental things the United States does at home during the New Deal and during World War II that are unthinkable today. One could argue, I'm not necessarily going to make this argument here, but one could argue that the United States wins World War II because it adopts many elements of socialism. Yeah? The Office of Price Administration, wage uh, limitations, right? The United States is actually setting uh, wage ceilings. Right, the creation of special perquisites so people will stay in their jobs, all sorts of things that are done to take control over wages, control over profits out of the private sector and to nationalize that, to control labor in that way. Um, it, it's not really socialism, but it's things the United States are doing that don't make sense if you believe this is some corporatist conspiracy or you believe this is some way to uh, you know, defend imperialism. What is it that the United States did uh, at home during World War II? What was the war about? It was an experimental effort to invent a new form of governance to defend democracy at home and conduct global campaigns on a scale the United States had never done before. And I have so much respect for that generation for being willing to experiment, for being willing to take risks, for being willing to do things that would have seemed un-American in any other setting. And I'll just remind you that that's exactly what the critics of Social Security said in 1935. And that's exactly what business critics of government control over wages and prices said. A vibrant democracy experiments, a vibrant democracy is not afraid to mix systems and mix approaches. And, and, and that's the only way I can explain how World <coughs> War II was fought by the United States. And, and by the way, Roosevelt was called both a fascist dictator and a socialist and a communist by <laughs> Americans <laughs> it, during the New Deal. So right, it's exactly. like, he's like, I must be doing something right. I've got, I'm getting <laughs> free from both the left and the right for my that's fascism right. or my communism. Uh, next question is going to be to your right, about halfway back, please. Um, why has America lost, I, I'm, we're so ignorant, the young generation of kids, students and college kids are so ignorant about even the time frame of, um, of World War II. I taught for 30 years at junior college and college and I would ask my students, you know, when did the war take place? And they couldn't, very few could even know within 50 years of it. And I'm just kind of wondering who's to blame because this is the seminal event of the 
of the 20th century and maybe in all of, of history. And I just think we've done a really, really bad job yes. of, uh, of, of driving that into young people. And I just, so who, who should we blame? I, 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 think we should, I think we should blame ourselves for allowing our communities and our governments, states, which is mostly state and local, that make educational choices, to so devalue the teaching of history at the lower levels. That's the problem. I, 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 have, I, I have, as I said, I teach 300 undergrads every semester, and they come out of schools, sometimes very good schools, and, and as you say, they're so poorly informed about history, and more often than not, it's because the person teaching them history was not actually trained to teach them history. It's often a coach. I have nothing against coaches, by the way. But most good schools don't have the football coach teaching math, but they do have the football coach teaching history. And this is a problem. Yep, it is. It is indeed. Next question is going to be to your left towards the front. <clears throat> um, maybe we can call it, maybe we can call it a necessary war. A necessary war. But my question is, what is the legacy of World War II on religion, one of those four freedoms? That's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things that I'm struck by about Roosevelt's leadership during the New Deal, but especially during the war, was how, um, how much he emphasized his own Christian faith. Roosevelt was a, you know, a, a, a Episcopalian, and he went to you know, St. James Church in Hyde Park uh, regularly, really pretty much every single time he was in Hyde Park while president, he was there on, on Sunday. He was a deeply religious man. He was not a... He was a spiritual person, and when he was asked, you know, what are, what are your great beliefs? What's your, what's your, what are your, what's the big system? What's the Rooseveltianism mean? And he was like, what are you talking about? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and I'm a Democrat. That's all I, that's all I can answer to that question. So he was, uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that he embraced his own Christianity, and if you look at his speeches, he talked about God and belief in God and the, the need of all, the desire of all human beings to worship something larger than themselves. He just assumed that that was a natural human instinct. We may agree or we may disagree with that, but it comes out very strongly in his, in his leadership style. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's really interesting to reflect on, on, the, on the, um, the, the place of, of, of religion in public life in, in America of the 1930s and 40s. Um, I think, uh, for all sorts of reasons, it may be more embattled today than it, than it was then, but I think there was a kind of unashamedness when Roosevelt and Churchill met, as they did from time to time, the, uh, you know, the Arcadia um, Atlantic Charter meeting, for example, you know, they sang hymns together that they both knew because they sang them from the same hymnal, and they sang Onward Christian Soldiers without thinking twice that maybe not everybody was a Christian soldier. They didn't care. They just said, this is, this is a representation of what our, our belief system is as leaders. So it's, it's a very interesting, um, it's an, it's, and I, I think it may be an, a somewhat um, understudied dimension yeah, of the I war, agree. would you say? I agree. I spent uh, a fair amount of time looking at this when I was writing my book on Henry Kissinger because, of course, he's Jewish, uh, and he's part of a large generation of German-Jewish immigrants, there are probably some in the audience, uh, who uh, become central to the American war effort, particularly in counterintelligence and, and other areas. And it's interesting because Will is, of course, 100 percent right. There's an outpouring of religiosity during the war, as there is in the American Civil War as well. But what does shift, especially for Jews, is it's a, it's a more ecumenical mm -hmm. religious expression. Uh, other scholars, I didn't come up with this, have argued that this is really the beginnings of Judeo-Christian arguments. That, that phrase is not even used, really, until the middle of the war. And it's initially Hebreo-Christian and then Judeo-Christian. We've all heard that phrase used. Um, and certainly for Jews, it's not to say that anti-Semitism goes away. In some ways, it increases. But it is that uh, there is a place intentionally created for Jews and to some extent Muslims and others within this larger religious framework that wasn't there before. That makes Henry Kissinger's career possible, quite frankly, and he's very self-conscious, or he was until a few days ago, very self-conscious of that. <laughs> he may still be he thinking. Might be, we, I mean, I'm always worried where he's, he is. He's that. living inside your head, that's for sure. <laughs> 
But let me, let me then put a point on that, if I might. Um, so it is to say that Americans took religion very seriously during the war, as they did also during the Eisenhower years. Yep. Um, but it, they were not saying, for the most part, that we are a Christian nation. Those are two different things. That's right. Those are two very different things. things. And I think uh, of that age, and uh, Roosevelt very much understood the country at that time. Uh, we were a country that was founded on uh, trying to escape from uh, religious persecution and, uh, and, uh, and theocracies of one kind of divine right of kings and so forth. And, and uh, so freedom of religion is something that everybody understood in a different way than I think they do today. Uh, but it meant toleration of other faiths uh, and, and the, the separation of church and state uh, was just ingrained in, uh, in uh, I mean, you remember when Kennedy was running, everybody was worried that the Pope was going to be running the country here, right. so, uh, because right. he was Catholic. I mean, so right. there was that fear of, uh, of, of having any kind of a dominant uh, faith in, in this country Absolutely. that goes back to our founding. And I think that that freedom of religion, he spoke to the values of, of, and the beliefs of, of Americans at that time, and I think we would be well to to remember that. My own father was a church historian and wrote a book on uh, church and state, and that's, uh, I think he'd be surprised at uh, how the country is, is really changing on just that point. You all, you all remember the only president to be baptized while in office? Of what? The only, only president to be baptized while in office was Dwight Eisenhower. Oh, really? Because he was not baptized in a Mennonite, you know, oh. River Brethren faith that he was raised in because he didn't do infant baptism anyway. But he became president. He said, you know, I really have to demonstrate to the public how spiritual I am, how yeah. much I believe my faith. So he said, Mamie, what church are you going to? And she was Presbyterian. So he went to the National Presbyterian Church in Washington, and he was, uh, he was baptized in, the, in February right, right after he had been sworn in. So that's an indication of how seriously they took uh, uh, yeah. public displays of their own uh, religiosity. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's yeah. interesting. We have time for about two more questions to your left in the front. Thank you, as always. I'm always wondering how, do, how much of the uh, what happened in World War II was impacted by how it started. The fact that it was a sneak attack and when FDR is saying no matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people will win through to absolute victory, and he just really galvanized the country. My father, born in a small town in Maine, uh, two people, uh, friends of his, were 4F. They killed themselves because they could not be, they could not be a part of it. And I just kind of wonder if the, the, the isolationism went away immediately, yep. and just far different. I'm just curious your, your thoughts on that. Well, I think, I think it's a great question. Um, uh, I, I think the reversion of, or the, the rejection of isolationism was not automatic after December 7th. I think it, it took a lot of work by Franklin Roosevelt uh, and others. But what I think the Pearl Harbor attack did for Roosevelt, and this does not mean it was a conspiracy, it was not, um, <laughs> but what it did for him was it took the onus of responsibility off of him for conditions that led to war, which is to say that the United States was conducting policies in East Asia that I believe were actually the appropriate policies, but they certainly cornered the Japanese. Um, and, but there didn't have to be a debate about that <coughs> once the Japanese undertook this extreme attack upon the United States. If they had attacked only the Philippines, which is what the United States expected, it would have been much harder, this is the point of your question, sir, it would have been much harder then for Roosevelt to escape the isolationist arguments yep. against the war. So the Japanese, in that sense, did him, uh, did him a favor <coughs> in that way. And I think Roosevelt had learned uh, from Lincoln the value of putting the onus on the other side to have made the first attack, and then to build the case from that. So I think you're right. The nature of the Pearl Harbor attack transformed the politics in the United States and gave Roosevelt an opportunity he probably wouldn't have had if we had had the attack on the Philippines but not on Hawaii. By the way, Hawaii was not a state then. I have to remind my students that, right? This was, not a, this was actually not an attack, right, on the United States as such. 
What great president brought, brought Hawaii into the Union? <laughs> the answer is always Eisenhower to every question, people. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Last question is going to be to your right in the front row. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Robert Edsel. I'd like both of you to take us inside the classrooms, and I want to follow up with to ask you the question you asked but then didn't answer, which is a play off of the issue of you, you commented that your 300 students are smarter and better. Yes. Uh, and you said you could tell us why, and I'm interested in knowing why, in particular with your observation about why do we have the shortcomings with younger people on understanding history, and I think you hit it squarely on the head. It's a state and local problem, and we're not, we're not having people that know history teaching history. So how is it that, what are you seeing in your classroom, and Will, what are you seeing in your classrooms? I think you can take us to a place that is outside the books and the history that we all write about and study, and give us some insights, because I'd sure like to know. Yeah. So I, I have a, a bunch of reasons why I think our students today are, are better, uh, better than they were in the, in the past, better than my generation uh, was. And that doesn't mean they're more informed on all issues, they aren't. Uh, the most important reason why they're better is uh, they don't think it's going to be easy for them. They are not complacent, even those from uh, privileged backgrounds. Um, they, I ask at the beginning of every semester, every semester, how many of you think you will live better than your parents? And very few put up their hands now. Uh, and that actually, I think, uh, makes it easier to teach because I can say, if you don't do this. <laughs> um, so, so that's one thing. They're not complacent. Uh, they really believe they're going to have to do something to get ahead. Second, um, they want to make lifestyle choices that they think will be comfortable for them but also make the world a better place. So my median student wants to work in uh, environmental business, right? Doing something that cleans the air and makes money by cleaning the air. Um, but they want to do good. That doesn't mean they're idealistic, but they want to do good. And unlike my students just 10 years ago, uh, Goldman Sachs is not always the most attractive job uh, for them. They're making different choices. COVID has reinforced that, I think. COVID has reinforced that. And then the, the third thing I'll say, and this is more a function of teaching at a place like the University of Texas uh, or the University of Virginia or Yale or Stanford, wherever it is, um, it is so much more competitive to get in. It's so very, very competitive um, to get in that uh, they really want to do well. They really want to compete. Uh, it doesn't mean there isn't great inflation and things like that, but, but they, they are better and better just because of the competition to get there. Now, that still opens the question, what about those who aren't in, <coughs> in our classrooms? Uh, but I've, I've often said this, I'll say it here. Uh, I would take my 300 students and I would flip them with members of Congress with the House tomorrow. <laughs> send the members to my class, send my students to the House. <clears throat> well, I, I want to strike a, just a slightly different note, which is I think um, I'm, not, I'm not quite so sure that this, the students are better than we are. I think they're, they're really quite different. And we have to understand that they've, that they've, that they've, been, uh, that they've been raised in just a very different time. Um, there are so many uh, different kinds of headwinds that they face. Some of them are technology. Some of them are the, just the changing nature of family, the, the na changing nature of the country. Um, my own sense is that uh, many college students arrive at college exhausted. They're drained because high school is really hard, but it's hard in ways <laughs> that don't necessarily prepare them right. for independent judgment, um, for uh, reasoning, reasoning, critical thinking. Um, they, are, they, are, they are forced to take a great deal of coursework. The, the testing is constant. The competition is high. The um, sense of Peer, how am I doing against my peers? The, the, the anxiety about will I will I succeed? Will I win the trophy? Will I get into college? Will I please mom and dad? And so for, is is suffocating, and honestly, the rates of mental illness on college campuses is skyrocketing. Now you may say, well, that's just because they're coddled and the, and, the, and they they're allowed to say that they feel ill, not go to class. I don't think so. I think it's a real epidemic of of uh, of, of anxiety and other kinds of mental illnesses that they're facing. The pandemic didn't help. It accelerated it, but I think it's a real problem. I also think they're much younger than 18-year-olds than, uh, were um, 30 oh. years ago. Oh. They're, they're, in many ways, their parents have done a lot of the, you know, sort of um, 
egging them on and pushing them and, and working with them and, and, uh, and, and protecting them just because they love them. But the result is a lot of times, you know, there's a sense that they're not quite sure how to uh, operate independently in the world. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry. I just think it's, it's they're, they haven't quite developed the, 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 the muscles yet to, to, to confidently stride into the future. And I think they're, so I think they're younger than an earlier generation. Doesn't mean that they're not brilliant. They are. They're capable of absolutely anything. Um, I would say just this last thing, which is that many of my students, they don't, don't necessarily, they're, 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 there's, a, there's a tension I've, I perceive in them between, on the one hand, wanting to become their parents, wanting what their parents have, and wanting the sort of same aspirations, and on the other hand, feeling that their, their parents or their generation have completely screwed up the world. And I, I don't know that, how they, that they know how to resolve, of course, how would they know, how, they're teenagers. But they carry that tension within them between wanting to, wanting to believe that the system is gonna work, but fearing that the system is broken. Yeah. And that yeah. creates some well, of this anxiety that I think they carry with them. So teaching college students is, uh, has uh, all sorts of hidden challenges that goes beyond the material, but the benefits of studying history is that you can say, let's read this document together. Yeah. Let's, let's think about this time period and let's evaluate the evidence. Let's develop interpret, you know, interpretations and argument together. And that's how you develop the muscles. You right. know, that's how you develop the confidence, is I think right. doing the work. Yeah. If I could follow on just one little thing on that, because I think Will's absolutely right, especially about this tension between they're wanting to be their parents and also there's a, this frustration with the world their parents have, have, have given them. Um, and, and this is maybe some piece of advice all of us can take, right? Uh, so many students come into my office and they say, and this is why I love them, you know, I'm really interested in history. I'm interested in what I'm hearing in your classroom. I'm interested in poetry. I'm interested in literature. But my parents and other forces in society are telling me I won't get a job and that I'm good at engineering and I should do that. Uh, and I have nothing against engineering. I don't understand it. We, um, we need engineers. <laughs> but, but, but I think that message, and I think that gets into the mm -hmm. space, right? Yeah. They want to break out of the system, but they feel the, the anxiety about doing that. Um, this is usually the conversation that leads to a student saying they want to have three majors, at which point I say, then you have no major. <laughs> um, but but the, the point being here, I think we, we can do a better job of encouraging young people to pursue their passion rather than what we think will be the pattern they should be on. Because let's all be honest, as historians in this room, we don't know what the workforce will look like in 10 to 15 years, and any prediction we make is gonna be wrong. And so the best thing we can do is encourage our students to pursue their passion, whatever it is, mm -hmm. find what they're good at, and then convince someone to pay them for what they're good at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part. <laughs> Uh, final, final, final round of applause final, final. for Dr. Nick Mueller, Dr. Jeremy Surrey, and Dr. Will Hitchcock. Thank you, gentlemen.